I, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, but sometimes when uh, I feel like the Lord's presence is on me and around me, I, uh, especially when I get up here, I, I, I'm, I'm convinced that, that whatever words need to come needs to come with understanding. <laughs> but there's some moments. Ha. I can do it just, mm. Oh, glory. I, uh, 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 my, 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 you know, because I don't know what's about to come out. And you, unless you get interpretation, you might not understand it. Hallelujah. I, I uh, was with a number of ministers over at a church, and they were having revival and had invited all the ministers up to the pulpit. And so like everybody else, you know, I went up to the pulpit. I'm not a big pulpit person. I, I like preferably I'd rather be out here. Uh, when I'm up there, you're looking forward, and the first thing you do is look at what's going on up in the pool pit. And I'm looking at y'all, and y'all looking at me, and we're going to say, which one of us going to move first, okay? Uh, you know, so I, I really don't care for that kind of whole dynamic. So I prefer to be right there right where you ain't looking at me. I'm not looking at you. Your mind's supposed to be on Jesus. My mind's supposed to be on Jesus. And I don't want you to get caught up with what I'm doing. I want you to have your own personal relationship with Jesus and experience with the Lord. But we were in the pulpit, and this brother, the presence of the Lord was so strong, and he didn't know the church he was in, and he wasn't sure, and he felt that presence rise up in him so strongly, and, and, and he just, and we both, he looked over at me, and he said, I don't know if I can hold it much longer, and, and uh, he just said, <laughs> you know, and, and uh, he said, well, they, they won't get upset just in case they don't, there's no tongues going on up in this church here. And so he just said, you know, and, and I picked that up from him. So once in a while, I, I'm, I'm trying my best to hold it and contain it because I, especially when I'm in another church uh, and I don't want to be out of order. That's not where the Lord called me to shepherd. And so I want to respect those boundaries if there are their limitations and restrictions. When I go elsewhere, I'm going to share the word of God. I'm going to do that. But some of the other things, I want to be sure that it's, you know, okay in this house. And if you say okay, then get out of the way. Because I might tear through that. I might kick my shoes off and take off running down the aisles. I have done that. Praise the Lord. But you gave me permission. I ain't got to hold back now. So praise the Lord. And, and uh, just really just feel free. The Bible says where the Spirit of the Lord, there is liberty, there is freedom. And uh, I really, I want people to feel this sense of God's freedom with them. If you walk out here in bondage, if you walk out here restricted, then there's something wrong going on. It doesn't mean that God is not there, but you haven't invited him into this area. Sometimes we hold back those little places, you know, and we really don't want God. It's almost like he's trespassing if he get into my business. He's trespassing if he go to that little place that I hold, you know, sacred, you know, where I'm holding on to my sacred cows. I, I don't want him invading in that place. But when we surrendered, it was all. He wants all, every bit of you. And uh, that means, and it takes a moment. It takes a moment to learn how to yield and surrender everything over. This morning as I was in my restroom praying and I was talking to the Lord and some things came very clearly to me. And one of them that, it kept hearing it over again, I'm there, I'm there, I'm there. And it was like I wasn't picking up on it. You know, I wasn't getting it. I mean, we say it a lot, but it was like God said, but I'm there. I'm there. And if there was a word to say to you this morning, God is here. He's here. And you know those things that you've been struggling with? It's there. Your freedom, your deliverance, your healing, it's right there. It's there. It's, it's there. See, don't walk out here thinking it's not there. It's there. 
You see, and too many times we do that. We come to the church, to the house of God, and we want to surrender it all, but we, we got that struggle going on inside of it, just totally releasing. Sometimes we're afraid how others are going to look at us and see us, so we hold back, and we don't let go, and we end up walking away, and you go home like this, still bound, still restricted. It's like you got, a, you got one of these, these belts are tied around you, and, uh, and you can't free you. You know you can't came to the house of God, you knew the bondage that was there, and God said, give it to me. I'm here. Don't walk out of here with it. Because I have a tendency at times that, you know, I got my little private areas that I don't want anybody invading. I like to say that I'm transparent, but I heard Sister Bonnie this morning when she was praying, but there are some places of fear. There are some places where I've held back, some places where I'm not really letting go and really trusting God like I need to. And what happens when I don't, then I got to carry on all that other junk that doubt and unbelief brings, and I came into his presence I can't I can't, listen I don't know about everybody else all I know is about me all I know is what my experience has been and and, and I know that when I came through the door I really want I needed some help badly but I'm not here to say that I've reached some place where I still don't need it. Even some 30-something years later, I need God badly. I mean, I'm ser I need God seriously. Because when I walk back out that door, all the junk, sometimes even in the house of God, all the junk is still there. It's still waiting and momentarily I may step away from it because sometimes momentarily when we particularly doing praise and worship and if you really let go and you get into the praise and worship you ever notice you forget about all your troubles huh? You f during that, you forget about it. It's it just like it's secondary. You know, it's, it's almost like coming with a limp and you get in the church and you get to praise it and you forget about the limp all of a sudden because you're caught up into what's going on. You feel a little bad, but you forget about your little bad feeling for a moment because you get caught up into what's going on. And we'll do that. And we'll, we're, we're, there's a freedom that's there. The problem is, is that after we finish praise and worship, he taps you on the back and he says, uh, you ain't forgot me, have you? Come on. Hey, uh, I, I, I know you done had a good time and I know for a few minutes you, was, you were there, bruh. You were there. You were right there in the place. You found the spot, but that's over with now. Huh? And uh, I don't want you to forget me. Because, see, my intentions is that when you walk out of here, I want you to walk out here carrying the same worries that you brought in here. I want you to go out still, still afraid. I want you to walk out here still timid. I want you to walk out here still doubtful. Now, don't forget that. And we give in. I, uh, over my, just my little brief time in the Lord, I've seen so many things. And probably if I had to say the number one thing going on in the church today is probably fear and worry. But it seems to have always been there. It seems like this whole worry thing seems to be an issue. For church, well, I've worried all my life. Thank God you're not walking in the old life. He said old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Which one are you going to walk in now? Huh? 
If his word is true now, if you really believe his word is true, it is settled. God's word is true. And you are a new creation. Old things are truly passed away. Why are you still going by snatching some of it and bring it into your new walk? Because the moment that you bring it into your new walk, it stops being new again. It starts to turn. The Bible says a little leaven, leaven at the whole lump. And after a while, you've set aside this new walk, and now you're walking in where you were before. You didn't notice the transition. You, I mean, it's so subtle. You don't realize, man, I'm worrying. And, and I found myself here recently starting to do more of that, that when that moment of worry begins to come and something pop up, oh, oh no, oh, no, no, no. You're not. -uh. I've lived with you for too many years now and I'm not going to let you go any further so you can take that thought and you know where you can put it at because I'm not going back to worry again. I'm not going to carry the cares. And I, if I've given them to the Lord, why am I still trying to carry them? It's, it's subtle, isn't it? It's sneaky. Insidious how he gets in there. And you don't notice it for a while. And the problem when you don't notice it, you argue to protect it. Well, I, I just feel like I gotta, I gotta worry about something. You just don't understand what I'm going through. My situation is different than anybody else. So I gotta hold on to a little bit of worry and you'll fight to keep your worry. And we're all exposed to it. We all have those moments. But that's why you're in a warfare. Yeah. That's why you're there. That's why you, you have to become aware of where you're at. The song was appropriate today. You know? We declare war. But it's not the demons that's jumping out and cutting up out there. It's the demons that's whispering in our ears and telling us. You say, oh, they don't whisper, right? They whispered in Jesus' ear. I guess maybe you're different. The question is, after they whisper, what are you going to do with it? You're in a war. And he'll take whatever grounds he can. But please forgive me, because I went some other way. And what I want to do is take, and this is not going to take long, I, I, I feel like I got a few words that I need to share to those of us that are here, but more importantly to those that may be watching. And that temptation sometimes that tends to bring us to a certain place, and we don't see maybe the, the um, danger that may be associated with it. And I just feel like I need to address it this morning. So what I'm going to ask you to do is a couple of things I want to do real quickly here, so please stay with me. I remember a few weeks, last week, where we were singing the song Bulletproof. Good song. We were jumping and moving, hands flapping and feet going on, and we were talking about we bulletproof. Praise the Lord. We had it. We had it there, you know, because I can't nothing get to me. Hallelujah. Hey, I'm bulletproof. Hey, hallelujah. And it's good as long as you're in the house, you feel like you're bulletproof, but you can't stay in the house. You got to go back out there, and out there is where you really need to be bulletproof. Huh? And the bullets aren't, or the arrows aren't, like we think. They're not designed the same way as man designs his bullets or his arrows. Those arrows and those bullets that come, they come with the intentions of getting up in here and getting up in here. And what they want to do is just, they want to wound you a little bit. They keep hitting you and wounding you. And all of a sudden you find you're, the, you're, you're, you're staggering from so many of them because you haven't recognized that you've got the shield around you. They really couldn't get to you. The only way they could touch you was that you open up the door and you let them come in. Last week, too, we sung a song, I'm not alone, your spirit lives within me. Uh, 
I love that song. But what's more important about it is when I walk out of here again, is whether I'm still aware that his spirit is within me. I'm not trying to get to God because God has come to me. And he hasn't abandoned me because he already promised that he wouldn't. In fact, to be sure of it, and that's where he was dealing with me in the bathroom, he has come, he says, I live in you now. I'm in you. I'm in you. God is with us, not distance from us, but he's with us. And uh, so what I want to do here in just a few minutes and just share, I'm, I'm going to some things I want to skip over. Let me, let me read through uh, some scriptures where I can. Job the 33rd chapter, and last week it had come to mind, verses 14 through 18, and it stuck with me. And while you're locating it, in the Old Testament, God used men and women to do things that were beyond our ability to perform on their own. In the Old Testament, God did mighty miracles, huh? To, to establish his love for those he called his own. He did some really serious stuff, folks. He... He fed millions of people every day for 40 years. They never had to go hunt. They never had to go plow. They never had to do in that every day they got up, food was provided. Not, not a handful of people, millions of people that was there. You understand? And every day God continued. He gave them meat. He gave them manna for 40 years years the food was there he saved them from their oppressors there were many that tried to take them in take them down and they couldn't do it other nations he even did things like opening up a sea so that his people could walk through you know he raised the dead he even stopped the sun one time this is our God he said, but what, what's all that about? Because, see, he's the same God today. He's the same God that has come to live inside of us. Sometimes when the enemy gets it in my head that God is not going to move on my behalf. No, no, again, hold, hold, hold it, hold it. I'm not talking about y'all. So this ain't got nothing to do with y'all. This is about me. Sometimes I have those moments. And I forget who he really is. In Job 33, 14, 18, that God wants to have a relationship with me. He wants to speak to me. He spoke to me. And, so, and listen, what he did in the Old Testament. Do, do, you, do, you, do you know about your God? One time he spoke through a bush, a burning bush. And he talked to a man through a burning bush. Another time, he, he spoke through a donkey. Yeah. He could have chose something a little bit better than a donkey. I could even appreciate my dog saying something to me. I can appreciate, you know, maybe a, a monkey who's, who looks a little bit like us and say, look here, Irv, I need to talk to you for a minute. I could appreciate that a little bit more, but instead he spoke through a donkey. Anointed words. Godly words came out of the mouth of a donkey. And he spoke to us through dreams. Focally. So many other ways that God spoke. And Job wrote this, For God may speak in one way or in another, yet man does not perceive it. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls upon men while slumbering on their beds, then he opens the ears of men and seals their instructions in order to turn man from his deed and conceal pride from man. I think a couple of weeks ago we were talking about dreams and for me it's, it's this thing, okay God, 
help me get my mind back in the place where I can see and receive the dreams. And I don't know about you, but ever since then, I, I tell you what, I've been dreaming up a storm lately. I mean, it'd be coming. And I mean, I used to kind of have stuff I never remember, but it seems like since that moment and bringing it out, it's like my faith told me God wants to use dreams in my life. He wants to show visions to me. And what happened was that I found myself now more, seemed like I'm more, more perceptive. I'm, I'm receiving it more easily. I'm not dismissing it like maybe I once did. That God wants to really talk to me. And I don't care how he does it. He can use the goldfish if he wants to. I just want God to talk to me. Okay? So I don't care how he do it. And I know he talks to me through the word. And I want to stay in this here because I know that every time, and it seems like every time that I pick it up, what happens is that I hear God speaking to me. And I think many times, you ever pick up the scripture and start reading and close it up after you've done a little bit of reading and said, man, what was that all about? I didn't get nothing out of that at all. It just seemed like nothing moved inside of me. Well, I found out that if my ears are open and I really want to hear if my heart is open, what's going to happen is that God's going to talk to me. And I, I don't even care what the scripture says. God's going to talk to me. It's his anointed word. And if I'm sensitive enough, what I'm going to find out, I may start there and then I may find another scripture popped up in my head and now I'm over reading something else because God's going to talk to me. God is going to talk to me. So stay with me. And I hope all this makes a little sense here in a few minutes. Go to Luke, the 11th chapter. Luke 11, that's New Testament, Mark, Matthew, Mark, Luke. If you're going to John, you're going too far. Go back to the left. Beginning at Luke 11. Answer the phone, player. Praise the Lord. And follow this. The, the disciples has been following Jesus. Huh? They, they, they dropped what they were doing. Because something down on the inside was deeper than anything else they had experienced. Some were fishers. Some probably were farmers. Some were carpenters. All kinds of things. And they dropped it. And they start walking with Jesus. And, and during this whole time, Jesus is expressing the kingdom to them. He's making sense out of the scriptures they had heard when they were a kid. And they're watching this manifestation take place. Yeah. Steve and I were talking earlier the day, and I had just been doing some studying here that I want to continue here in, in Matthew, the 53rd chapter. And then it dawned on this is 800 years later. And when you read that, it's just like everything is coming to pass. But it doesn't make sense because no one was there to act, to direct, to choreograph, or anything. And Jesus just lives it out. And what he does is that they've been watching this manifestation. Okay? And so, and I imagine that's exactly where I would be at. If, if every time I turned around, he was either sharing something with me that, that was so deep and it affected me so strongly, I think I'd want to hear a little bit more. And right in the middle of this, Jesus would come along and, and somebody sick would come up to him and, man, they walk away healed. They, the, it was more than just someone talking now. The, he, they passed by a funeral buyer and... Jesus turns around, touch the thing, and tell the person to get up, and they get up. 
They did. It don't make sense. As they walked with Jesus, all these wonderful things, and Jesus kept saying to them that the kingdom of heaven is here. Not coming. The kingdom is here now. We are living in the kingdom of God. And that's a whole lot to grasp. But they see these things, and so they come to Jesus. I imagine there was a lot of discussion going on before they even got to this place. But they come to Jesus, and, and now, you know, and I can imagine, here's where I would be at, Lord. As we put this thing together, there is something we keep noticing all the time, and what we keep seeing is that, it looks like every time you pray, something happens. So they, there, there's this connection now. He goes away and then everything. No, no, I know how to put this. He goes away and he pray. He comes back and all hell breaks loose. Because it can't hold on to the people any longer. Hell has been having its, its way with man since, since the dawn of man, since he sinned, and suddenly hell breaks loose because Jesus shows up. Every time that Jesus pray, it looks like hell, and hell leaves a little bit of his power. Every time the next day when he would pray, these wonderful things would happen. So they see this, and they come to Jesus, and I know I would be there Lord, teach us how to pray. Now, he's not just talking about any kind of way because some of them have been praying anyway. Some of us have been praying anyway. But he comes to them, he says, listen, can you understand what he's saying here, what they're saying to him? Lord, we see the connection there, so teach us how to pray like you pray. There's a difference between me praying and you praying. When you pray, hell breaks loose. I want to see hell break loose again. Show us how to pray like you do. God speaks. So he said to them, the Bible says, he teaches them. He said, because they wanted to be taught like John taught his. He says, "Our listen to this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. One translation says, give us day by day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone who is indebted into us who trespass against us. And listen, do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Oh man, how many times have we heard that? But can I just for a moment, let me just reveal something here. And I pray that anyone that is watching this hear what's being said right now. As, we, as I read through that, there is no place where I saw him say, I or me. If you don't agree, read it again. He never said, give me. He never said, give I. He never said, forgive me. He never said, forgive I. But what he did say was, us, we, instead of me and I. So evidently, that the prayer that we were praying, that he gave us, had to do more than just me. But when I look at this, if he's teaching them, he's going to take them beyond where they are, so it becomes more inclusive now by using words like us. Don't just pray for yourself. He said, deliver us. Yeah. Are you following me? Amen. They said, teach us to pray. So Jesus said, give us, forgive us, for we lead us and deliver us. 
Not one time in there does he say, me. And that has some significance to it. As you go back through the Old Testament, through the New Testament, okay, there is nowhere in the Bible God sanctioned not coming together. He didn't. He never sanctioned not us assembling. From Old Testament to the New Testament. And a number of you may get a little upset because we've allowed ourselves to be lulled into this place of comfort where we, we're bought into the culture that says separate but together. Mm. It sounds good, didn't it? It sounded good, though, the first time I heard it, and I said, I said, hmm, yes, I can understand that, that we can be separate but be together. Oh, that means we don't have to assemble ourselves anymore. Oh, so here's what we're going to do as believers. We're going to lock our doors, put some seal over it. If we can, what is that word, hermetically seal or something like that? We're going to seal our house away from everything and everybody else. We're going to make sure there's no contact. We're going to do everything we can, and we can't find that in the Bible because it's not there. But it sounded so good that many of us found solace and found comfort into separating ourselves. And there are church people who haven't been out for months and months and months and months have not had an assembly with anybody else. And here's what I'll tell you, I guarantee you they've gotten weaker. I guarantee you they're weaker. And I can understand as I'm learning, but as a result of, of all of this here that's going on, our together now seems to be distance, and it seems to be okay. I can justify my separation. Now, I'm not telling you get out there and start doing stupid. What I'm saying is you need to assemble. At some point, you need to get among the brethren because that's where the inheritance is. And he didn't say you can seal the inheritance up in your house. At least I didn't read that anyway. So we've turned from coming together as meaning together separately. And what's happening is that our faith is being challenged. It's like we, we want to redefine our faith mandates to fit situational conditions. And I was guilty. I was guilty. I, yeah, this seems to be spiritual. This seems to work. And I didn't question it for a moment. But as I sit there and I walked around through the house, it appeared something was out of whack here. Something was whack. And I couldn't put my fingers on it. And it took me a moment to realize that I need the brethren. We canceled church service. Man came, we shut down everything. I was almost scared to get on the air and talk to people with Zoom because I was afraid something might come through Zoom and jump on us. And believe me, there's some people out there that believe that. They, they're, they're afraid. Okay. Now, as I, what I'm getting ready to share right now, I had the hardest time trying to get to this place because as I was typing my notes, every time, several times, I would get to the scripture and I'd start making some comments on it. And every time it would go blink, just went away. And so I would get in, I try to put, and I go back and I type it in again. This happened about three or four times. And find the last time, I said, oh, no, you don't. And it stayed. I don't understand that. I, it don't make sense. And I, somebody couldn't tell me what was going on there. All I know is what happened. Go to me real quick to Ephesians, the second chapter, verses 1 through 3. I want to speed this up a little bit. 
Ephesians, second chapter. Notice it. It says, and you, uh, Paul's talking to him, he made alive who were dead in trespass and sins, in which you once walked according, which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. And you go ahead and read the rest. But my point was to get to this one little thing here, and he writes about the prince of the power of the air. I didn't put this in there. But what it appears to me, he's saying, there is this spirit that is called the prince of the power of the air, which leads the children into disobedience with God. So let me ask you a question. Those of you particularly that may be watching this or how you may be receiving it, I don't care, you could be watching something else. If, if the prince of the power of the air has any kind of power, can he distort what you pick up over the net? Can he distort or censor what we get through through our electronic devices. You follow? Can he mess with the airways? And sometimes we've experienced it and it didn't make sense when the word was going. It seems like all of a sudden everything out there gets started distorting and get the cutting up and everything. He's the prince of the power of the air. So if that's possible, if it's possible, then can he control at some point what we pick up electronically? So what happens when he censors it? What happens when he says, we're not going to have this online? And you follow this now, and only thing you've learned to become totally dependent upon the electronics. You've to, totally dependent upon what you can get through the airways. Totally dependent, and suddenly he imprints the power of the air, decides and says, you know what, enough of that. I remember a few years ago, and there was a major push to try to get TBN off the airways. No good reason, didn't make any sense, somebody didn't like it, and, and people had to petition and do all kinds of things to keep them on the air because they were pro broadcasting the gospel, and we think that the prince of the power of the air can't mess with us if the only thing you're doing is getting it by this way. Am I making a little bit of sense now? Huh? Is it possible... And I'll say that because we just witnessed something this past week. Governor Cuomo wanted to shut down all the churches and tell them no more church service. And, then we, and follow this, that if the Supreme Court hadn't have stepped in and told him he couldn't, there'd be no church service, and the only way you could get it would be by this thing, which is controlled by the prince of the power of the air. You've got to assemble yourselves. Right in front of us. It's happening. I remember back when we first started, they started doing all the internet stuff and they broke the system. But everybody else was going on and everything was okay. But when the church got, community got on it, suddenly the system gets broke. Well, we can't use that anymore. Am I making a little bit of sense? Okay, now follow, continue to follow me as I, 
show this here. And it says in another scripture here, when God was speaking in the Old Testament, he said the Lord commanded Moses to give us inheritance among our brethren. So if the inheritance is among the brethren, if God says where two or three would come together, and he doesn't say separately, he doesn't say, but he says come together, mutual meaning that there is some kind of contact with the believers that you can't get it all by airways, that our inheritance is among the brethren. Jesus said where two or three would come together, and he didn't say separately. In my name. He says, I'll be in the midst. I can't tell you what happens when we do it separately. All I know is what Jesus said. And he said, we got to come together. Our inheritance is among the brethren. We can't turn around and put a pause on that because it's the enemy at work. And when we look around, we done lost everything. Our faith has gotten weak and we've gotten ourselves in trouble because there is another gospel out there that's still yet being preached. And as we've witnessed this attack right now and what's going on, the intentions is to pull us apart. Satan is smart enough to know that if he can divide, he can conquer. Huh? He knows that if I can get you to the place where you stop going to church, and you, I can get you because I'm whispering in your ear all day long. I'm showing you, you know, what, how things ought to really be. And after a while, you find this... I, Mm-hmm. Yeah, listen, yeah, you got words start to come out your mouth you ain't said in years. Huh? You know, all of a sudden something happened and you can peel the paint off the wall because suddenly you didn't see the importance of why we need to come together. Huh? Suddenly you start looking at your bills and your spouse is arguing now over the money situation. You didn't argue that when you were going to church. You didn't argue that because you had others that could pray with you and stand with you. Our inheritance is among the brethren, folks. Now, I know there are people sick and infirm that cannot come. Go, do it. I know that we can't just turn around and put 500 people up in here. I understand it. But here's what I believe, that if we can only have 40, 30, or 40 people in here, then let's, what's wrong with having a second church service so that we can still have another one and another and another. If we got to come back at 6 o'clock, open up the door so somebody else can come and get the word of God, do what we got to do, but let the gospel of Jesus Christ keep going out. Yeah, it's tiresome. Yeah, the body can't keep up with it. But we got to come together. No matter how you look at it. They seen the connection. The disciples did. When Jesus prayed. And they came as a unit and said, teach us. They saw the connection with the power. And then that same one says, I'll be in the midst of you. They also witnessed on a special day, the day of Pentecost, what happened when they came together. Imagine on the day of Pentecost that they had decided to stay at home and we're just going to worship God with just me and my little family. Huh? Imagine what that would have looked like. Now, I'm not preaching condemnation. I'm saying don't be lulled. Friday night I felt that sense of lulled. And uh, it was so nice. My socks on my feet. T-shirt on. And I was quite comfortable. And my little granddaughter comes into my little office. She says, Papa, are you going to church? Are you going to pray? Like that. Mess me up. I was comfortable. I had my feet propped up. I'm watching a good movie. Everything is okay. 
I'm fine with the world. Just leave me alone. Temperature just right. I'm doing good. And she comes in and says, Papa, are you going to pray? I told her, get out of there. <laughs> but as I sit in the chair, suddenly the chair wasn't as comfortable as it once was. Because, see, it doesn't matter about anybody else. What matters is what God is doing with me. And at that point, he was letting me know. He said, uh-uh, 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 uh-uh. It's not, I'm not going to whoop you. You got to want this. See, you got to want to pray. You got to want to assemble. You got to want to praise God. I'm going to start dancing as soon as I can get God in my feet. God's beyond your feet. He's all in your heart. If you want to dance, all you got to do is get up and dance. You're still waiting on something. You didn't have no problem when you were out there on the street. You didn't have no music, and you were getting it and carrying on, and you were doing it because in your head the music was going on. Suddenly you can't get you lost your dance. You ain't got no kind of step. They tell me I ain't got no rhythm. I don't care what you tell me. I'm going to dance anyway. I'm going to praise God because I know what God has done for me. I know what God has brought me. And I know what happens when I get among the brethren. And I forgot. Listen, I can remember at Restoration and we used to pray in the parking lot each evening. I remember what, five o'clock or six o'clock, somehow a lot of the staff, some of us would work our way over to the parking lot. And sometimes we'd have a little circle, but a number of times we had a big circle and we would pray. And I would see God answering prayer and doing something. I remember when we used to pray in the evenings here too. I remember three o'clock prayer. I remember five o'clock prayer in the morning when it was hard to get up out of the bed and come down because we were having prayer service and people would come and we would pray and we would go back home. But we would witness the mighty things things that God did and all today only thing I can do is do my shoulders up like this how God kept answering and answering and answering prayer because there was something when the people of God come together and they begin to pray corporately get ready because God says any two of us agree something is gonna happen and it ain't got to happen out there and it does many times but most important it's got to happen in here because I can't be. And you can't hang out with God like that and walk away the same person. You can't do that because when you hang with God, something happens to you. And if God's in the midst of us, what better place there is to hang out with God? Because even though you may be sitting there, here's what I know for I know my God. I may not know you, but I know God. And what I know about my God, when you came in this door and the presence of the Lord was in here, I know God was doing something on you already before you even recognize, before praise and worship, God had already started doing something on you. I know that because I know my God. I know that if two or three of us come together, here's what I know. He ain't in the corner picking his nose. But what he's doing is he's going from person to person. He's touching you and he's changing you. But you have to open up. You got to receive it, Lord. Every time that I come in the house of God, I don't care what denomination it is. I don't care what church service. They may be playing spooky music, but if they lifting up the name of the Lord, I know something's going to happen to me because any time I get in the presence of the Lord, I know God God is working on me. And I watched Sister Bonnie come up and pray, and, and I knew that was the person at that moment to pray. I knew it was because she started praying, and she started getting down to earth with God where some of us need yet to get down to earth. And we said, God, you know, Lord, I've been messing up and there's some stuff going on. Forgive me, Father God, because I know where I ought to be at. Doesn't matter about everybody else. I know where I ought to be at. I can't, I can't hide that. I got to get out. I got to be open with God. If it means getting on my knees, if it means snot is running down my face, don't you worry about it. I'm trying to get me and God where we need to be at.
And I can't always get that at home. Sometimes I got to get where the Spirit of God is moving at. And I need his convicting spirit to touch me and reveal to me some things about me so I can see and I can lay it down before him. Sometimes he don't show me as much at home as he showed me once I get among the brethren and let me know I can get closer to God today. I'm about done. My heart dropped when I thought about all the reasons why we stop praying at five, stop praying at three, stop praying on Thursdays and Fridays, and my heart began to drop. Scripture came to mind, listen to it. He says, I know your works, your labor, your patience, that sounds good, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. Man, that's good. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not. Wow. And have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do your first works or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. This wasn't to some group out there making some noise. This was to his church. You get it? This was to his church that he had to come to his own church and had to say, repent. I'm not having anything against the work you're doing, but somewhere in there you've lost your first love. Restoration, I thank God for what we get to do every day. I thank God for the thousands, did you hear me? Yeah. Thousands of people that get food through restoration every day. I thank God for the thousands of people who has lived at restoration. I thank God for all the hundreds and thousands that have come to classes and heard things and learned things. I thank God for those marriages that he's put back together and those families that he's restored back together. I thank God for all of those things going. But if they don't keep their personal relationship going with God, It's greater. Your works are good. But somewhere in there you lost your first love. Somewhere in there he told them. Did you notice in there he didn't say anything about you come together and pray because they had stopped. You come together and because you're my bread because of the brethren and because you love one another and because others will come and they will need the spirit of the living God moving up on. He doesn't say that. He named off some works. And at the end of that he said, You've lost your first love. But he didn't say you were hopeless. He says this come back. Come back. Hard working church. Hard working body of believers. But they stop following the direction of the head. The things that we do have to be born out of prayer, not hard work. I just pray for God's people. And I've never said anything like this before. But we'll pull.
the scales off of our eyes and realize we've got to find a way to come together. I don't have any problems if everybody in here had a mask you came together. I don't have a problem if everybody in here came with gloves on your head, you came together. Because I believe at some point we're going to trust our God enough where the gloves going to come off and the mask going to come out and we're going to be carefully do what it is that God called us to do. I believe it'll happen. But I also recognize too it happens when we come together. Huh? I know what I've seen from prayer. I know what I've seen when I've seen the body of God's believers come together. Not only from the beginning, not only from even in the Old Testament when they would come together, the Spirit of the Lord would flood the temple. You know? The importance of why we have to do this. Why we have to do this. It's important that we assemble ourselves. He said to be careful in these last days that we assemble ourselves and not do as some has done and forsaken it. And we can't do that. Do not forsake. Do not forsake the assembly. How many times that means? I don't care. It just means every available moment I can. There's an assembly. I just need to come together. So I'm not going to set a number. Well, I did it once a week. I don't know. Twice a week. I don't know. I have no idea. I just know that it's important that we come together. Father, I thank you this morning. I thank you, Lord, for this hard word. And I know there'll be some who'll draw back. There'll be some, Lord, that'll be afraid. And Lord, and I think that's something we all experience. Father, I pray, Lord, that your spirit would move through your church, move through your body, move through your people. Lord, that the enemy cannot trick us with something that sounds wise but that's contrary to your word. Forgive me, Lord, when I've been guilty of that very thing. When I try to use my earthly central reasoning to disregard what your word had said. I know how many times I've quoted the scripture, trust in the Lord, but I would pray this morning, Lord, that you would extend that out for all of us through your body to trust you, to trust you. And I pray that those that may hear this, those that may see whatever, however it may come, Lord, that you would just, your spirit would just begin to deal with their heart about trusting you. So I'm convinced far worse things are on the horizon. And that if we can't trust you now, it's going to be hard to trust you later. Give us, Lord, what we need so that we can stand strong, Lord, so that the light is brighter. You said that you can present to yourself a glorious church. I want to be a part of that. And no matter what the cost may be, I want to be a part of that. And I thank you, Lord, for your presence here this morning. I thank you, Lord, as you've moved through this room. My word in my heart said, I got it. And I got it because you showed up. And I know that I can't walk out of here the same way I came. So thank you, Father. 
You deserve the praise. You deserve the glory. You deserve the honor. And I don't know any other name to come in, but in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father. Listen to me. If, as I've said last Sunday, and I meant it, that if you are in need of prayer, if you're in need of laying on of hands, and you're not afraid, I'm not afraid that I'll pray for you, I'll anoint you with oil, and I believe that the, the elders will gather around you according to what the scripture says. And the rest will be in God's hands. You said, but I went last week and the week before. I'm one of those folks, I'll keep laying hands till it's done. I'll keep, I'll keep praying and keep believing until you receive it. Because I've seen too many things happen already. And he's the same God. 